Welcome to the backstory on ballot question 3D, which asks voters to approve changing the city charter to allow the city of Longmont to lease ground for development for 30 rather than just 20 year periods of time. My name is Tim Waters. And as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, I have the good fortune of interviewing elected officials, city officials, community leaders, uh, leaders in our business community and our nonprofit community on topics of interest and relevance to Longmont. And today I have the great good fortune uh, to have a panel of folks who fit all those criteria, elected officials, community leaders uh, of both business and nonprofit organizations in, Saint Brain, or in Longmont and in the St. Brain Valley. The names of the people in this and the faces of the people in this program are likely familiar to everybody in town, but I'm gonna remind you who they are and then I'm gonna ask them to talk a little bit about themselves. Marsha Martin, a, a council member representing Ward 2 in a member of city council. Jessica Erickson is the CEO of the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. Dave, Dave Emerson is the executive director of Habitat for Humanity of the St. Brain Valley. Bob Balsman is both president of the Longmont Performing Arts Initiative, LAPI, and of the Longmont Chorale. And Elliot Moore is the director of music for the Longmont Symphony Orchestra and is the conductor of the Longmont Symphony Orchestra. So welcome to you all to this panel and thank you so much for carving time out of your schedule today to join me in this conversation. You know the big topic, uh, we have a ballot, we have ba ballots are out uh, as we are, as we're recording this, they just came out. A big election this November on a host of issues and at least one of the issues on that ballot is one that you all care about as do I, as does Marsha Martin. So Marsha, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us about you about why the council would care about this and about you and, and the council generally, and then we'll give everybody a chance to, to fill in some gaps of, of who they are in their organizations. Thank you, council member Waters. I'm, I'm um, doing this as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, not as a council okay. member. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm doing this as a council you are. member. Yes, you are. Okay, and even though my views don't represent the council, um, I am a former engineer by profession and since I've gotten onto the council, I have under, come to understand that the city of Longmont is a big technical problem. The city of Longmont owns land and it needs to make sure that that land has, is put to the highest and best use in order to get good things for the people of Longmont. And Sometimes that means enticing people, um, private investors, um, to invest in that land and use it a different way than it has been used. And some of the land isn't used at all. Um, and to get things have changed since the city charter was written. And so one of the things that's important is that 30 year financing needs to be available to people who usually generously for the public good want to invest in improving city land. Um, every city on the front range has already amended their charter to allow either 30 or 40 year leasing for this exact reason. Longmont is behind the times and it means that sometimes Longmont can't compete for public-private partnerships in the way that adjacent cities can. So regardless of which of the very fine uses can for public land that is your favorite one, this is an important mechanism to get all of them done. Jessica, tell us about LEDP. Uh, sure. Sorry about my camera quality. I'm not sure what's going on with it, but um, the Longmont Economic Development Partnership is a public-private nonprofit economic development organization. So we're, by all definitions, a public-private partnership organization uh, focused on economic development and the economic sustainability and, and long-term viability of our community. As part of that, we lead an economic development strategy called Advanced Longmont 2.0 
I really began implementation late last year, early this year, uh, right before we were hit with the COVID-19 pandemic. And different than how many other places approach economic development, we really focus on not just the traditional measures of growth for economic development, but also on prosperity and inclusion. So how does that growth benefit our entire community equally? Within that, we're looking at the success and viability and growth of our industry base, as well as our talent at work, um, sorry, labor pool here in Longmont and in the region. We're focused on creating places in Longmont that are attractive to both industry and to talent, as well as transportation connectivity for our community. So we believe that uh, in particular in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, that adding tools to our toolbox to achieve the visions of all of those focus areas of our economic development strategies create resilience and recovery for our community. Um, sorry, adding to our toolbox to be able to do that via the charter change to create the opportunity for 30 year leases makes good sense for Longmont and its economic future. Thanks. Dave Emerson, tell us about you and Habitat. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. So um, my wife and I moved here in 2006. I started as a volunteer with Habitat down in South Palm Beach, was in the corporate sector and just fell in love with the Habitat model. So we've been in Longmont uh, for, I guess, 14 years. I thought I'd do this for a few years and then move on. But uh, I'm just really, really inspired by the things that I see with Habitat. Many of you know uh, or may know what Habitat does. We are a home ownership ministry. Um, to really understand Habitat, I think you need to go back to the 60s when Habitat was formed, a place called Conania Farms in rural Georgia. And at the time, they saw very, very deep division uh, pe with, uh, with people. They saw people in need, particularly farmers. And so um, the visionaries back then really came up with two concepts that you'll still, excuse me, still see with Habitat today. And um, that is building a house with volunteers. So the community coming together, diverse group of people coming together, all different beliefs and and opinions and, and building community by building that house. And um, then that house is not given away. It is something that uh, lower income individuals can afford. We design the mortgage to be affordable. And then that uh, mortgage gets recycled into building more houses. So when we look at uh, just your local affiliate here, your local chapter of Habitat, over half of our cash flow comes from our mortgage payments and mortgage commitments. So the homeowner um, not only is helping themselves, which is just incredible to watch over decades, especially when there's children in the house, the things that they do, their perspective changes and so forth, um, but they know they're helping their neighbors, which is really uh, an agent of change for other things. Thanks for being in this. Thanks for all that you do. <laughs> housing. We're going to come back to housing as a big challenge in just a minute. Elliot, uh, tell us a bit about you. Uh, you're high profile in this community. Everybody has seen you perform in some way. Tell us who you are. We, we know how talented you are and, and a bit about LSO. Well, uh, my name is Elliot Moore and uh, I am the music director and conductor of the Longmont Symphony Orchestra. And it's such a privilege to have that position because what I get to do is work to transform our community through music. And it's something I'm very passionate about and something that I certainly care deeply about. The Longmont Symphony has existed now for 54 years. This is the, though the first year that we're having a virtual season due to the pandemic. And so it's really been, um, you know, something to behold how the Longmont Symphony has come together, how we're, we've been able to respond to the, the current uh, crisis really that, that we're, we're looking at and how we deal with that and, and the wonderful ways in which we've been able to deal with that and bring music to people and uplift people. We have several programs that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, one is our sensory friendly nutcracker performance 
which is for differently abled children and of course their families. And, and so this is an example of how we can uh, reach every group of people through music in our community. And we're very passionate about doing that. So like I said, it's been here for 54 years and we look to be here for many, many, many more. <laughs> Very good, Bob Balsman. Last but not least, in this in this panel, uh, tell us about you, about both Lapai and the Corral. Okay, sure. Well, I came to the Corral back in 2007, uh, probably following a story of a lot of our members uh, who had music way in their past, but then had a long hiatus. In my case, about 20 years, and then came back to randomly find this ad in the Times call calling for singers for the Mozart Requiem, which was my first experience with the chorale. And I was hooked and I've been there ever since and became the board president back in 2016. Uh, the Longmont Chorale is Longmont's longest running uh, performing arts organization and indeed one of the longest running community choirs in the entire Western United States. Many people probably don't know that. And what people probably don't know either is what a thriving performing arts scene Longmont has. We have six member groups in Lapai, all of which have been in operation for at least a decade, most for multiple decades going all the way back to the 1930s. But if you drive around town right now, there's very little sign of the performing arts in Longmont that you can just see going down the street. You might see the theater company's building and you'll see Stewart Auditorium, but as far as anything else, you won't. And that's because for the most part, we are having to work with churches and schools and we're very glad to have them because if we did not, we could not do what we do. Uh, that being said, they were not purpose built for what we do and they have other purposes. So, you know, we're trying to fit around their schedule and whatnot. And so that's why we're in pursuit of a dedicated performing arts facility in Longmont and 3D would go a long way towards making that easier to happen. If you make for a 30 year payment on something versus a 20 year payment, you, you recognize there's an annual savings there. If that savings comes in for the venue that trickles down to rents that we end up paying, which then trickles down to lower ticket prices for our audience too. So that's why we're really excited that this is on the ballot. All right, well, I'm gonna, we're gonna drill down on some of what you just talked about, Bob. I'm gonna come back to you on, on sure. some of what's gonna trickle down and, and, and the implications if we don't have something that trickles down, right? I mean, everybody's gonna make their decisions about what to do here with this ballot question. But I wanna go back and start, Marsha, with you in terms of the follow-up. This is, the, the council put this question on a ballot a year ago. Mm -hmm. It failed. It's back on the ballot uh, in this election cycle. Uh, so go back and, and, and begin to, to drill down or unpack maybe on some of what Bob just touched on in terms of the difference between 20 and 30 years. And why now? Why would the council wanna put this back on after having so recently been voted down by the public? Uh, from a council perspective, why would it matter now and why 30 versus 20 years? So I'm gonna do it in the opposite order because why now is a really important question. Um, this whole issue of managing finance uh, as a city is something that I like to call economic engineering. And people are gonna hear that word and say, well, that sounds shady and it is, so not, it's just the city using the resources it has to make sure that the city has good things for the public. And of all the places I've lived in my life, the city of Longmont and its municipal government is the absolute most devoted to providing good things for the people who live here. You might know that Longmont is limited in its ability to grow. And 
if you're going to have a city that can't get richer by growing, you know, as a city like Houston has, you know, just by growing out and out and out, then you have to find other ways to make life better for the people who live here um, by uh, improving the economy so that more money flows past each individual. It's a, to use the cliche, a rising tide that lifts all the boats. And the city of Longmont has is pursuing quietly a number of visions that do that, that cause money to flow into the city of Longmont and stop here so that the, raise, the wages of our wage workers tend to go up so that um, people have more disposable income, so that people have more options available to them, and so that people's lives who live here can be richer. And that helps everybody. It helps our businesses. It helps our students. It's just good all the way around. Um, and it helps our people who are housing insecure. And that's one of the most important things to me personally, because it allows us to engineer a, a diverse ladder of housing options, starting with um, things that are affordable to people just getting on the ladder or people who have had problems um, economically and uh, you know, providing options for people at every stage of their lives. So that's what can be done with this. Why now? There's really two things. First of all, last time we had this on the ballot, we were just trusting the people that, oh, this is one of those things that the city asks for every so often. And as a city council member, I have to take responsibility for not realizing that we needed to explain. So this time, a lot of engaged residents of Longmont are trying to explain and make sure that everybody knows why this is the case. We didn't think it was necessary last time because people of Longmont are very good and usually do trust the city and vote for things like, like street taxes or a little bit of an extra sales tax to pay for extra police. You know, those things always pass and we thought this would pass, but nobody understood what it was for. So now you know what it's for. But the other thing is we're in an unprecedented economic situation because of the pandemic, we need to be able to engineer our recovery. And that means doing things to leverage the assets we have to make more money for the city, not to take it for the city and you know, use it just for the municipality, but rather to improve the economics of the city, make money flow, and help people out of the holes that they're in because of the pandemic. The reason that public public private partnerships are gonna be a big deal is because we hope that recovery grants are going to be flowing in to Longmont. They already have to a great extent, but most of the, the ones that are here so far are absolutely relief, you know, just, just fill in the holes, pay for things like childcare, um, special measures that businesses and, and schools have to take uh, in, uh, to keep things safe during the pandemic. But we've lost a lot of businesses. A lot of businesses uh, have, have got recovery work to do. They need to feel secure enough to rehire. We need to build things that will create jobs and if we can use the money that's going to be flowing in from above to do that, we can do this recovery better. And just having a better set of financing options, one of which is 30 year leases, will help us do that. So it's a big, long wheel of causality to get this done. Um, and this is one little piece of it, but it's one little piece that'll make a big difference. All right. I'm going to come back to you. Um, uh, you kind of frame this as if you're driving down, whether it's Main Street or anywhere else in town, what one might expect to see physically um, to reflect how vibrant an arts community we enjoy in Longmont. 
Um, so what are some of those things you would expect to see and, and, and what, do you, what, do you, what are your assumptions about why we don't see them in lung? Um, why we don't see them, I think, is just a matter of growth and just, you know, it just hasn't been done yet. Um, to some extent, um, you, you need to look at the fact that these groups have been making do with what they have right now. And so you tend to say, well, we don't really need to necessarily do anything there. The problem is when you look beyond what's happening right now to what could happen, not to just benefit groups like ours, but other performers in town attracting regional acts, attracting nationally touring acts. We have this fantastic crossroads location in Northern Colorado where our groups already bring in people from other communities. And so we know that if we had the proper facility that not only would we uh, ourselves continue to build on that and we would become more visible as well. The performing arts in general in Longmont would become more visible, but then we'd be able to bring in these other acts that are not local, but that people go to other communities to see. And that's important because what happens with that on the economic side is then they take their money out to those other communities. So we're talking about things like the Budweiser Event Center or down to Broomfield or even down to Denver, where instead all of that could be coming back to Longmont. Well, and I'm, 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 at some point in this, I'm gonna come back to what's at stake in this election, but I wanna, I wanna move to Elliot. Uh, Elliot, you made reference to um, the, 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 the symphony has been around for what'd you say, 54 years? 54, yeah. And, um, and you've been able to adapt to various physical settings from the, uh, the Vance Brand Auditorium to the Stewart Auditorium. And, and now you've had to adapt to no facilities, right? You've been doing the work virtually. So uh, uh, good on you for all of that adaptation. But we're gonna come out of a pandemic um, and uh, we're gonna look forward to the opportunities when we can come back together again to enjoy our talent in this community. Um, so why would why would you, as this as the as the music director and director and conductor of the symphony, uh, why are you concerned about this ballot question in the future of the symphony, especially in the time when we can you know post pandemic world we can come back together? Sure. Well, you know, Tim, let me at least say also thank you for having me on the show, um, and and this is a wonderful opportunity for me to thank the Longmont Symphony for you know agreeing to let me do this. The Longmont Symphony. Um, you know, is very careful. They uh, don't want to wade into issues that are going to be on the ballot box. But because they understand that I have, uh, you know, I'm an informed individual who um, has kind of a mandate to, to educate the public about these things that I know about, like concert halls, um, I'm really thrilled to, to be with everyone today. You know, I think that this is a transformational moment for us. We are really at a crossroads and the pandemic, I think puts um, kind of a fine point on that. By the standards of most people, you know, an orchestra is kind of only as good as the musicians who are in it. But I actually happen to believe something a little bit different. I think that um, the orchestra is really only as good as the concert hall that they perform in. And why is that? I think for several reasons, but when I think about like a violinist who obviously tunes their violin and, and looks after the care of their violin so that they can draw forth the most expressive sounds, the concert hall is our instrument. And so in order for us to really touch people's lives, for, in order for us to really have a transformational experience and to give that kind of experience, we have to have the right kind of setting. And I think that, you know, there's some other things about performing arts centers. One is that in today's modern world, it is one of the few spaces where people can come together to celebrate. And I think that um, a good concert hall is, can be a place of beauty and it can promote all kinds of well being. And to that end, I think that as we sort of come together, as people come together in a concert hall, it has the ability to unify people. And 
that's something that I think is particularly important in today's climate. That ability to, to, to have unified experiences or experiences which unify people is something that I certainly place very highly at this point. And so I think that for many communities across certainly the United States, if not the world, at some point or other, they recognize the need for these kinds of spaces. And I think that this issue is something that can help us reach those kinds of goals. Um, and it's something that I would like to see for the performing arts because the performing arts make the community a livable place. Without the arts, I don't know why we do what we do, you know? And so that's something that I, I want to continue the work that we've created and to really take advantage of it. And so I think that this gives us an opportunity to take advantage of it. Well said, and I, earlier in this conversation, uh, both Jessica and, and Marsha made reference uh, to, to what we do here that, that attracts talent. Much of what Jessica does, and we're gonna come back to Jessica in just a few minutes in terms of the broader economic development perspective, is, um, is, is try to create pipelines that bring talent to the community to accomplish what we, the goals we wanna accomplish as a community. And um, one of the things that we might be mindful of is what do we have to do to keep talent in the community <laughs> once having attracted uh, talent? And I would, and, and speaking for myself, and I think probably lots of other people in Longmont, seeing you stick around uh, as the, as the uh, director of music and the conductor of the symphony it would be a high priority for LSO and for, for the broader community. Uh, so as people think about the kinds of things Bob referenced that we'd like to see, um, not only does it make a statement about the community, it makes a statement to those who we'd like to bring to town and keep in town because of the talent um, that they possess and that they share with us. So uh, just part of that perspective. Dave, we're talking a lot about the arts, but there's a whole nother perspective and Marsha made reference to, to housing um, and what, what's possible. We, there's so many ways that communities can get creative and collaborative to create housing options in communities, which is one of our biggest challenges in this municipality and in every municipality, is housing of access and affordability. So from your perspective, given your, your, your commitment with your professional life, why do you care about this ballot question and what might it represent as opportunities for habitat for humanity for the St. Vrain Valley? Sure. Um... And, and so many, so many thoughts going through my head, uh, but uh, I'll share a couple of, of perspectives, if you will. So one of the things I didn't mention is that uh, I'm spending a lot of time in Estes Park with Habitat. We also build an Estes Park. We responded in Lyons, um, and it is very eye-opening to see the impact of uh, a lack of affordable housing in and and Estes Park and a shock to the system in Lyons, what that has done to the makeup of a community. So in Estes Park, at one point, they used to graduate 100 seniors every year. It's now fewer than 20 a year. Um, I have friends up there that will tell you they have lost a generation of people uh, in Lyons because of the affordable housing that was lost in the 2013 flood. They lost a lot of income diversity. And from an arts and music standpoint, a lot of the individuals that they lost were musicians, uh, were artists, as you can imagine. Um, so that's really why it's interesting to me. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different things to consider with any ballot question. And as Elliot uh, kind of alluded to, Habitat considers itself purple. We appeal to a lot of different uh, folks, but I guess when I look at, I'm, I'm a finance person. What we do beyond building the house is we set up finding, financing that um, people can be successful with. So across the nation, Habitat has a less than 2% foreclosure rate. And these are for working class families um, who never would have really been able to afford a home. Um, so when we look at uh, that success, obviously we have to keep the cost down. So that's where land becomes available and, and at a affordable rate. 
but also the difference between a 20 year financing and a 30 year financing, as you can imagine, is profound. It's $300 a month uh, minimum. And uh, that obviously makes a huge difference for someone making 16, $17 an hour. I also think it's kind of ironic that I'm asked to speak today um, as I shared, I started in 2006. Today is the first day that I do not have an active project in Longmont. We dedicated two houses on Saturday. Um, and right now we do not at this moment have a project. Now the pipeline is very, very good thanks to the support of the city and others. But uh, those projects are in the entitlement phase and, and it takes time to do, to do it right. To, to account for everything. So land is only going to become a harder and harder challenge. And if we could stretch out somehow the financing and development, we know we can recover the cost within 30 years. So the, so is it fair, you know, I'm not in the real estate business and I'm not in the finance business, but I, everything I know about this I've learned since I was on the council, elected to council, that like 20% of the cost of developing residential properties is, is tied up in land. Is that a fair estimate? That, that's fair and that's probably understated. So um, if the city owned undeveloped ground, which it does, then it could lease to Habitat or to the Land Conservancy or to a developer that right. would partner. And the conditions of that lease would be to partner with the Conservancy or with Habitat or with both to do, to do residential development that's financed over the cost of 30 years. And at the end of that 30 years, all kinds of options in terms of what would do, what one would do, what the city might do, or the, de the development might do with either selling to the homeowners or uh, debt, uh, deeding it to Habitat or to a housing authority, uh, ways to, to maintain housing as permanently affordable to achieve right. that goal. All of which could be possible. It's possible now, but now it's limited to a 20 year horizon or cycle for financing, yeah. Right, right, and it just is not quite um, quite long enough to stretch yeah. out the, the development. Jessica, um, uh, from your perspective, you, you've done economic development in not just this community, you brought experience to this community doing economic development in different communities and at different levels. Uh, why would the Longmont Economic Development Partnership care, and I, and I and I do know that your organization has endorsed this ballot measure, encouraging Longmonters uh, uh, to support it. Why would LEDP care about this? What's the, what's the bigger competitive uh, context within which we exist now and will in the post-pandemic world? Sure, so I think when most people think about economic development and which is fair, they think about um, the announcements of large employers and in making significant investments and in creating a significant number of jobs in the community. Um, we also look at retention of our existing primary industry base and their ability to stay here and grow here. In recent years, the number one factor in those decisions, whether it's to stay and grow in place or to relocate to another place coming from somewhere else into Longmont, the number one decision-making factor is availability of talent availability of talent in the local region, but also the ability to attract talent from other places where um, the talent that they need is currently located. And in order for us to be an attractive place for talent here in Longmont, there are a number of factors that we have to have as a community. Those include things like affordable and attainable housing, um, affordable and quality childcare, um, as we've talked about so many times, quality education, um, and a quality of place, a quality of life that is unmatched by other places in the country and, and in the region. The reality though is that projects that create those things, that create education and childcare and affordable housing and cultural facilities aren't necessarily the most, uh, don't necessarily have the highest direct fiscal return on investment. What they bring is the bigger picture economic return on investment for our community. So in the form of wages, in the form of quality of life, in the form of ability to attract and retain talent, to develop our own talent and an induced and indirect spending for those people who are coming to and moving to our community to take advantage of that value here. And so in order to 
make those projects happen, understanding that on both on the both on the public and private side, don't create the highest ROI from a direct fiscal perspective. It creates an environment where public private partnerships become necessary and a stacking of financial tools in order to make those projects fiscally viable is absolutely necessary. And one of those things that we can do is as Dave's talked about, create a financing mechanism that allows for the city to enter into 30 year leases in order to support on the public side, financing of those projects that out of necessity are going to have to be invested in by the private sector. And for you, I'll ask you, I'll ask, but I'll ex extend this to Marsha and to, to the, the gentleman in this, in this panel as well. Um, and I think it's a pretty straightforward answer to the question. If this does not pass, um, what are the options uh, available for uh, La Pie, uh, a concert hall, for, uh, for, for housing, for development of affordable housing, or any of a vast number of other things we might want to do as a community? If we're not going to be able to create an environment where we can put together public-private partnerships that benefit the community, what's the option for generating the resources to do the kinds of things we're talking about wanting to do? That was a softball question. Marsha, you know. <laughs> I mean, there, there's always putting a tax question on the ballot. That's for, the answer. <laughs> That's the answer. Which, I mean, and, and recent history tells us that there's not, and whatever your opinion on that is, that there's not a lot of appetite for that, right? We, at a state level, turn down uh, um, funding of transportation through increased taxes. We, at a local level, turn down funding, public funding of um, uh, an additional recreation and sports facility with a um, hockey rink and pool. And so if that's not an option, um, let's consider some of these other options, like the 30-year lease, to allow for us to be able to provide those amenities to our community. Yeah, a, a year ago, um, some of the criticism, Mar and Marcia, you may want to weigh in on this, some of the criticism of this, of this ballot question was that there wasn't a proposal on the table. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a public-private partnership on which we could vote. Well, that's not the way these things work. Right. First, you have to change the condition to attract you know, the interest. Um, so there's not a proposal on the table, and it's unlikely that we would have one uh, if we're competing with other communities that allow for 30 or 40 year financing and we're limited to 20. Is that fair? Yes, I certainly think it's fair. And I, I think that although there is not a proposal on the table now, what is true is that there is a vision. Um, you know, the Longmont, Longmont has a vision constructed by the city council over the last several years and it includes um, ways to bring in uh, outside money for the city through the, con the performing arts, through having a, a convention or convocation center, um, through having um, a center for higher education. The, um, the city council's uh, acronym for that is STEAM which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. mathematics. Uh, it took me a second there to come up with the M. Um, but, uh, you know, what I have seen as a council member is that that vision, and by the way, part of that vision is making sure that all of the children and all of the people are properly housed, that growing up in Longmont is the best experience that we can make it. So that also means affordable housing. It also means a, a clean environment. Um, you know, it means a lot of things having that vision. And as I sit on the different um, boards and commissions that as a council liaison, what I hear people talking about that vision is a lot of excitement among people who are stakeholders in the community, but not necessarily fiscal stakeholders in a particular project. You know, um, uh, Jessica, you can uh, can verify this. You know, uh, Eric Wallace, who 
who is left-hand breweries, right? <laughs> he's not going to go build a concert hall and he's not going to profit from that, but he knows that the value of this being a rich community. And I sat in a, a economic development board meeting where he said, let's build steam. And, and so this vision is something that can get everybody in the community excited about enriching our community. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a no brainer given that 30 year leases just lowers the cost of money. And this is a great time to be borrowing, right? Because we have a really low cost of money and we have a, a, an environment where, where stimulus is gonna be something that the higher levels of government are gonna try to be giving us. So this is a no brainer. It's just an enabling mechanism that doesn't cost anybody a dime. So one of the criticisms that, that you heard uh, the, relative to this topic last time around, and maybe you've heard some of this as well, is that that's all pure speculation. Uh, and I guess I would say, based on what you just said, Marcia, one person's speculation is another person's vision of what's possible. Right? Uh, so I, I wanna give everybody in this, on this panel a chance, if there are any final thoughts, any last thoughts? If I can, Tim, I, I would say that the, um, the only thing I would add is when you're, you're talking about land and, and uh, doing something with land, um, you have to have a bit of certainty to begin investing in time and money before you really know what you have. And if um, you don't have the option, if it's, if it's 20 years, you have to set your expectation there and it really I can see a lot of uh, potential really never getting off the ground because um, the conditions are not there to even explore what is possible, if that makes sense. The, and the conditions that do exist in other communities right. with which we are competing, right? I mean, you're not dancing, we're competing just straight up. Any other final yeah. thoughts? And I'll just add, you know, to the point of it being speculation, even if it is speculation and the city never signs a 30-year lease on its property um, have just having the tool in our toolbox available to us um, as as a negotiating chip for uh, some of these projects that we have as part of the vision of our community um, absolutely harms no one that this charter change does not mandate 30-year leases it allows for the option if it's in the best interest of the vision uh, that our community has for itself. And it's fair to say that voters would have to decide whether or not they believe their city employees and their elected council members are smart enough to, no to negotiate terms in a public-private partnership that serve a variety of interests, but fundamentally first, the community and, and Longmont residents. Fair? Yes. All right. I, I wanna thank you for your time in this program, but more importantly, I wanna thank you for all that you do. Everybody on this panel, uh, you make such extraordinary contributions to the life of this community. Uh, so as, as a resident, I wanna say thanks. As a city council member, I wanna say thanks. And as a representative of the larger community, I wanna say thanks for all you do every day, 365 days a year on behalf of Longmont. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and viewers, that is the backstory on ballot question 3D coming up, showing up on your ballot as it arrives in your mailbox. Thanks for viewing. Thank you, Tim.